All right, welcome back to My Mom's Basement. It is Robbie Fox, and I am here with Corey Taylor on the day of his new album release, Oof. CMF2, out yeah. now. Yeah. I've been lucky enough to get a little advanced copy of this, so I've oh. been sitting with it, listening to it. It's really good. Thanks, I think it's man. awesome. Thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, it, uh, it took so, so little time to make that we've been dying ready for this thing to come out man so now that the day's finally here we're like we're really stoked about it and how has this tour been this recent tour it's been killer dude you know the great thing about this is that the first handful of shows like people didn't really know what to expect you know like so they come in and they're like what's he gonna play what's what's going on um and then they realize that you know we're playing new stuff we're playing old stuff we're playing slipknot we're playing stone sour I mean, we're going for it, you know, and we just, you know, we, you know, pull covers out of our ass and, and just have a good, good time, you know. Um, and once people saw that and realized, man, word spread. And I mean, the, 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 every show has gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Wow. So it's, that's it's awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's gotta be a cool feeling. I know first and foremost, you're a songwriter. When you oh, approach yeah. music, it's all about the songs. Right. How do you approach writing for different projects? Do you kind of assign songs to projects? Do you think about it before you start writing songs? I mean, I used to. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, uh, you know, there were definitely songs where I would be writing it and I would go, you know, this, this is kind of got a Slipknot vibe. I'm mm -hmm. going to save that for that. And, you know, obviously vice versa with you know, Stone Sour and whatnot. But now with this, um, I'm kind of greedy. I kind of save everything for me. <laughs> I save all the good stuff for myself. Um, but it also takes the impetus off of me having to feel like I'm contributing musically to, to anything else, you know? Like, I know I have a platform yeah. for the music. So if it's, unless it's something that I'm really, really, like, very dedicated to making sure that I get it in with, with you know, either of the bands or whatever, um, it, I just kind of go with it, you know? Like, I, uh, I, I'm, now I'm more than happy to just kind of sit back, be the lyricist, and or, you know, you know, kind of be the head arranger, uh, the sequencer, you know, stuff like that. It's, it's definitely something that needs to be done because sometimes you need somebody to come in and go, okay, we need to chop that in half. This needs to go here. That should be doubled there. This is the chorus. That's not the chorus. What the hell is that? You need somebody to do that. So that's kind of where my role as the lyricist comes in. I look at it and listen to it and I shape it. Do you feel like you could get more of your influences in in the solo stuff as well as opposed to oh, say Slipknot? Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. Yeah. Well, because I mean, the crazy thing is that Slipknot now has become this influence, you yes. know, which is rad, you know. And we're starting to kind of see that play out in like so many different genres and so so many different artists. Um, so with this, this is the this is me kind of paying it backward as, as well as going forward, you know, like. I can get my inner Bowie on, um, you know, obviously I can do, I can kind of write and, and perform in any genre and, but also make it feel very cohesive and very linear and, and have it feel like it's all connected, you know, even yeah. though it's vastly different, you know, I mean, Breath of Fresh Smoke is totally different from something like, you know, All I Want Is Hate, but because it's us and because we're able to make it work it all feels connected. Yeah. We just had Darius Rucker in the office. Oh. And he was talking about how back in the day, right. you would go on tour to support an album. Right. And now, you're kind of writing albums so you can go on tour. Right. Do you feel the same way? And does that affect the way you write? Are you thinking more about the live show than you used to? Um, I mean, it, it's definitely in there. You know, there's definitely songs where, that you write and you're like, man, this is going to be rad live. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a couple like, on this We are this the rest. One. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that song was kind of built to be a live song and yet the the re, the the record label really loves it and they they want to they're thinking about it for a single which nice. is cool yeah. you know so i i don't i think both kind of, both ways of thinking definitely have <coughs> their uh their places um i'm sure there are i'll say uh more what, artists with more seniority is that a nice way of saying yes. older people um, <laughs> it's a much nicer way there yeah. are like myself i mean I'm, I'm putting myself in that in that category um there are a lot of people who look at it from the standpoint of yeah let's let's put something out just so we have uh, a reason to go out because a lot of people don't realize that nine times out of ten people won't book you unless you have new material out 
And if you don't, they will book you at a lower fee. Interesting. So there's also that. I'll give you that dirty little Yeah, I didn't know that at all. So that's one of the reasons why a lot of artists put something out. Because then they have something new to offer. So they can go to the promoters or the agents and go, okay, we've got a whole new set of blah, blah, blah. Yep. And then they play the same set with one new song. It's just a shiny new coat on it. Yeah. Yeah. But then there's people like me who all you know, pepper my whole set with new stuff yeah. because I love it, you know, because that's the stuff you can't build a legacy. If people don't know the music, you mm-hmm. know, um, I get so frustrated when, you know, like a, like an artist puts out an incredible new album and then they just play one single off of it, you know, and it's, it's a bum out, you know, I've been connected to projects where that, that happens and I'm like, we got to play more and nobody wants to do it. And it's just like, come on, man. So, it's definitely something with my solo thing where I'm I'm putting my money where my mouth is when it comes to the, my approach with that. Um, speaking of live shows, our kind of fake band here at Barstool just played a Bojangles parking lot last oh, weekend. A Bojangles parking it lot. It was pretty sick. We got like right. 250, 300 kids packed into this parking lot. Nice. And we just rip covers the whole night. Nice. It's Love really it. fun time. I want to know what the weirdest place you've ever played is. Oh, dude, I played a Rathskeller at a college during lunch. During lunch. During lunch. Was anyone paying yeah. attention or were they all no, just eating? Not one person even looked up. It was, <laughs> so, and this was Stone Sour before uh, Slipknot. Okay. So this was back in the 90s. Um, we, had a, uh, we had a fake manager for a second who nice. was really trying to help us out, uh, but didn't really know what he was doing. And he booked, <laughs> we showed up thinking we were going to play later. Yeah. And that was incorrect. We played early. <laughs> And I mean, it's seriously us just up there, like going, like just, and nobody's even looking at us. Yeah. It's almost like they were like, they thought maybe we were like a school project. Somebody was <laughs> yeah. trying to do it. It's like and a cafeteria. Like, and I'm just sitting there. Just All mad. originals? All originals. Yeah. And, uh, I, cause I was just like, I'm not going to waste covers on these people. Like, they're not even <laughs> looking at us, man. Yeah. You know, so that was probably one of the weirdest gigs. I also, I also did a, a <laughs> When Bother came out, uh, I got booked through this weird radio contest in Seattle. It was 2002 Halloween, I think. 2002 or 2003. And uh, I was a, a contest prize for these kids for their Halloween party. Like a, I was like a performance? So I show up at their house. And like all these teenagers are like, I don't think any of them really knew who I was. Yeah. I show up with a guitar. I played Bother. And then we watched Rocky Horror together. And I was <laughs> teaching sitting on the couch all, with them? I was teaching them all the obscene lines that you do. Because I, I went to Rocky for like 20 years. Oh, really? So I know all the garbage, yeah. right? And then I ended up drinking with the parents in the kitchen while they were all out, like, dancing to horrible music. And now we're just getting wasted. And I'm like, try this Canadian club with this Dr. Pepper. This is gonna, <laughs> it's going to blow your mind, you know? It was so weird, dude. Like, it's, and I just, and I told the label, I was like, stop making me a contest prize. I'm not a prize this anymore. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. Because I, dude, it was in the middle of nowhere, dude. I mean, it, took, it was like 40 minutes outside of Seattle. And I'm in a car, and I'm yeah. like, am I being taken to be killed? Like, yeah, what, that's sketchy. Is there a hit on my life? Like, what's <laughs> happening, dude? So it was really, really weird. That's crazy. Speaking of live shows, before we get into right. the album track by track, our band has our first festival coming up in okay. like two weeks. And I wanted to know if you had any tips for a band playing their first festival. Make sure you're playing facing the audience. Well, oh, yeah. yeah. And don't face the amps. Yeah, don't face the amps. Don't yeah, face no, that, that's yeah. a bad move. Don't, yeah. yeah, always make sure that you're plugged in. I will be on. The, well, you know what? I'm the bass player, so I don't even need to make well, sure of that. I'll bury myself true. in a mix, you know. Yeah. Make sure you get, do, do a lot. You know, do a little. Uh, do some uh, some lower lip biting. Yes. Yeah. And then aim it at him. Kiss style. Oh yeah, absolutely. That would be awesome. Yeah. Um. No. Here. Okay. Here is a great bit of advice, and this is something that I've always done, my whole career. Play that show like there's twenty thousand people there. Okay. regardless of who's in front of you yeah play that show big because the bigger you feel the bigger people are going to be like god did you see that show yeah did you see those guys that's how you build a live audience that's how you build a live fan base is by showing them that it doesn't matter how many people are here this is the show you're getting because you're special 
Yeah. It's almost a fake it till you make it type of thing. Uh, it's not even fake because if you love what you do when you're on stage, whether it's 20 people, 200 people, 20,000 people, man, it's just all about entertaining those people because next time you come back, it's going to be exponentially bigger. So yep. those 20 people will tell 100 and then you've got 200 people there. Those 200 people tell and then you got 1,000. And it just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, hopefully, hopefully that's how it goes. There you go. We're we're going on right before Mike Campbell, which is like oh, making a, me a, feel like, come yeah, on, come on, man. That's a big spot. Dude. We're playing Blink One Eighty Two covers before one of the all time like <laughs> guitar. It's it's tough, but it's you know, gonna be great. It, it'll work. It's gonna be great, man. Hey, good thing we don't have to follow him. Well, exactly. That's the thing. Right. We're going yeah. on before him. Be lucky you're the one on before him. Exactly. Right. Exactly. All right, let's talk about this album because yeah, I think it's awesome, and I've been, like I said, I've been listening to it for a while. First of all, the cover art we got yeah. it behind us. All the outfits throughout the years. Do you have a warehouse somewhere with all the stuff? I've got. Well, I have many closets in my house. Gotcha. Stuffed full of crap that I'm sure my wife wishes I would get rid of. Certain closets, <laughs> yeah. You open it to jump scare. Right. Exactly. Well, there's that. But I mean, obviously. Well, I mean, look at that one. That's definitely yeah. a jump scare. Yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, you know, I. Well, uh, between Slipknot and uh, and my house, you know, we have a lot of storage for some of this stuff. And I actually pulled some of this stuff out of storage, so it's not actually at my house. But all of my crazy suits are there. Um, obviously, my uh, my my fake wrestler, uh, fake muscle shirt yep. is there. <laughs> um, all of these looks you can Google. Like it's either film of me or pictures of me, and uh, it's yeah uh, the the Frankenstein with the blonde. That's uh, the homage to the cover of Famous Monsters Number no. One, which is a brand that I own. I bought that a couple years ago, so I'm relaunching that. Um, so everything here relates to me in some way, especially this douche right there. <laughs> yeah, so. you got him on the back as well. <laughs> exactly. But that's kind of my homage to David Bowie. Um, so the whole thing is kind of an homage to artists that I've never really paid tribute to. Like the purple represents Prince. Um, oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. David, uh, that look is, is my homage to David Bowie. Um, and obviously, the the setup is my homage to, you know, Sgt. Pepper. Love yeah, that. Got absolutely. it on the arm here. Exactly, man. Yeah. One, of the, one of the most iconic album covers. Well, I could say that, or I could also say uh, We're In It For The Money, yeah. you know, which is Frank Zappa, which I also love. You yeah, know? that's awesome. I love it. So the box opens it up. Big cinematic opening. Right. You're playing the mandolin on this, I yeah, assume? Yeah, it was the first thing I wrote on mandolin. And I, I just bought it. And I was sitting in, I was sitting on the bus and we were on a tour with the, for We Are Not Your Kind. And I was sitting on the bus just kind of tinkering around and I started kind of playing around with the, with the chord progression. And I was like, this is awesome. I yeah. really love this. And the intro started to kind of formulate in my head. And that really kind of set the tone for what I wanted this album to be is like, that was going to be the doorway, you know, that was going to be yeah. the curtains kind of pulling back on the stage. And then the show is the set, you know, the show is the songs in this order, you know? So it felt really cool to kind of have that Eureka moment while I was sitting there just kind of playing this mandolin. And I was like, this is going to be special. I have it in my notes. Enjoy the show. Like what a great setup for the right. entire album. Was this written to be the opener? Did you know it as you're writing it? Like, Oh, this would, sounds I, like the intro. When I'm, when I'm working on something and I kind of have the idea that that's going to be the intro, that definitely sets the tone. So working on it. And when we were recording it, I knew sonically, this was going to be the yeah. way, not only that the album was going to open up, but we also use that as our intro for the show. So when you come and see us play, not only do you hear the box as the intro, but then we come out and we play Post Traumatic Blues live. Yeah. And it's just the perfect one-two punch. It's great. Which that one kicks off the chaos. Yeah. Like the yeah. drums kick in, the crazy guitar solo. There's yeah. such a great bass tone on it. Are you very particular about guitar tones, bass tones, drum sounds when we, you're making an album? I mean, I mean, there's definitely vibes that you try to lean into when it comes to whether it's heavy stuff or just rock stuff or punk stuff or the acoustic stuff, like the stuff that has that kind of classic like singer songwriter vibe to it. Um, but it's almost like golf clubs, man. Like you reach in your bag and you find the one that really fits. And my band is so good that we know how to dial stuff right away. And we, because we were playing everything live in the studio, yep. we knew that we would go, okay, let's try the 5150 with that. I'm going to go with my orange for this one. Um, or you would, you know, if you were doing something like Breath of Fresh Smoke, which I actually played my Les Paul Custom on, 
uh, that was the guitar that I wrote it on. Awesome. And I ran that through um, uh, a Wizard 800 uh, with a with a good like a night like a nasty boost, right? And uh, that just gave it that really great, almost like a gin blossoms feel, you know? Like yeah. You, you, so you're so you're constantly looking for the flavors musically, you know, to to try and sh- to stack the stuff. Um, and my band is so good that if I throw an idea at them, like a vibe, they immediately know how to do it. Or Jay Rustin, my production partner, knows how to do it as well. So each song kind of has its own soul, you know, and being able to kind of dial that tone up quickly, it, it, it makes everything so much easier that you can just run with it. And over the years, a song like this, does it get easier or harder to record in the studio? When uh, easier, vocally? Man. I mean, well, if you're still into it, yeah, it makes it so easy, man. It, it's the stuff that you're not into, which is a slug, it's a slag, it's 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 like it's like trying to walk around with an anchor, you know? It's yeah. like try try running a five k pulling a boat, you know what I mean? That's what it feels like. But if you're still into making music and into the you know the whole spirit of creation and stuff like that. It's it shouldn't be hard, man. It should be easy, you yeah. know, because you want to do it. So to me, the exciting part, even if it takes a second to kind of get everything together, the exciting part is watching it come together. Yes, you know? like and that's that's the fulfillment of everything that you've been thinking about. Because I obsess about this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I'm such a big Beatles fan. Get back when you're watching right. Paul exactly you know, strum along it's and such watch a that come out. Fascinating vibe because I've done that a million yeah. times with my songs, where you just you're just sitting on a couch playing something over and I do this on piano too, like mm-hmm. where I'm sitting and I'm playing and I will just I will go and I'll kind of start to add chords and I go. Oh, you just okay. find it. Yeah. Here's the bridge. That's something I'm going to come back to. And that whole process is one of my favorite things about making music. Yeah. Um, the next one, Talk Slick. How did you get that tone on talk the sick. intro? Talk Sick. Talk, talk Sick. I'm yeah. sorry. That, okay. So we took this little, that, I mean, the only real way to call it is pig nose. It's not an original pig nose, but it's a little, little two inch speaker in a cigarette pack. <laughs> and we duct taped it to uh, the console on the in the in the studio, right? And then I just plugged into it, and we put an SM57 on it, and I just it sounds so it good. It sounds like a, a buzz saw, dude. yes. And it was so fucking gnarly. Can I say that? Oh yeah, you can so say whatever. Fucking yeah, gnarly, dude. And it was perfect because that song is just such a an old school like hard rock punk soul. I was going to say I have it's, hints of your punk roots in there. Oh, yeah. Dude, 100%. I wear it so on my sleeve on this album. It's not even funny. Yeah. And uh yeah, this song is like if Guns N' Roses tried to write a Pennywise song or <laughs> I vice love versa, that description. you know what I mean? Yeah. So it really had this was like let's just lean into it and just chase the fucking dog on this one, you know. Speaking of Guns N' Roses, I saw Duff McKagan wrote like some nice stuff about yeah, this album. Yeah. Have you known him going back a I've long known time? Him a long time, dude. He uh first of all, one of the sweetest dudes on the planet, one of the nicest dudes, uh one of my favorite humans. He's also Duff fucking McKagan, man. One of the coolest you know, guys like, that ever lived, yeah. When you grow up watching some dude and you're like, he is a fucking rock star. And then all of a sudden, he's your friend and you're hanging out having coffee with him. Yeah. It will fuck with your head, you know? <laughs> so it's, yeah, the the fact that he went out of his way to do that was was so sweet. And um, the stuff that he said, I, I, I was reading it back and I was just grinning from ear to ear. Yeah. And I was just like. Okay, that's that's pretty dope. That's awesome. Duff's also one of those rock stars that he's looked cool in every era. Every like, era. Still to this day, criminal. I'm like, God damn, like, he looks cool. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Can you look bad at like once? <laughs> Not and he once. Just yeah. Does it? Him, yeah. Slash, same thing. Slash know, has looked dude. the same for I know. decades like, yeah, now. He's, at this point, he's a superhero for yeah. God's sakes. Um, Breath of Fresh Smoke. This is a Breath of Fresh Air to the album. Nice right. acoustic ballad here. Yeah. Who are your influences when you're writing something like this? Well, something like that, man. Um, it was definitely now that song full disclosure goes back to 2005 i wrote that a long wow. time ago yeah so i've had that kind of in my box for a minute um and is it was that influenced. like the only one on this album like that or no, is there more no, no no um uh post-traumatic blues the cadence for that song i wrote in 2000 2001 i actually tried Holy to incorporate shit. that on the iowa album Wow. And me and Paul and Joey were working on something, but it just never coalesced and yeah. never kind of 
became something that we could go, that's like, we never had the eureka moment, you know, because everything else just felt so, so much well, like better put together, you mm-hmm. know, so I kind of saved that. I was like, you know what, I'll use that for something else later on in life. Um, Beyond is, is uh, well, the, the main bits of Beyond are old, like from 2006. Uh, Midnight is a song that I wrote uh, back in 2001. Um, I actually wow. demoed it in the same session that I demoed a Bother, actually. You have crazy restraint for holding these out that well, long. Well, a lot of times, full disclosure, I forget that I write them. and then You I find, find them? them? Yeah, I nice. find them in my computer. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, like oh my God, good. I forgot wrote all that? about yeah. this. <laughs> so, so it's kind of cool. It's, I mean, I'm constantly writing, man. So I, like, I'll, uh, I'll demo something and it'll, it'll either stay at the top of the box Or it'll be something that I go, you know what? I'm not feeling this now. I'm going to rewrite it later. And then it slowly falls to the the bottom of the pile, you know? Yeah. But Breath of Fresh Smoke is something that I've had for years. And I've been waiting for the right moment to use it. And I've actually recorded that song with four different conglomerations of bands. Yeah. Um, Wow. I I demoed it on my own. I demoed it with a different band. I demoed it with uh, some friends of mine from another band that we were going to start like this almost like weird super group. Um, and it's, yeah. I, and then I demoed it with this one. It was finally this band that it really made sense. Yeah. Uh, because everybody brought these beautiful kind of old school, like English rock kind of vibes to it. But the soul of it is essentially, it's like Ani DeFranco, um, Ray LaMontagne, you know, the band, you know, those kind of vibes, you know, yeah. and I, and I wanted it to feel like that. Like you were, you were telling a story and the music just happened to be there, you know, definitely written about small town growing up in yeah, a small man. town. You and coming I mean, from Iowa. It doesn't get smaller in Iowa in a lot of ways, you yeah. know, so it's something that I definitely know about, but I also wanted to write from a different person's point of view, you know, even though I'm, I'm in it. Yeah. It's more as an observer. You're watching someone with this massive heart try to get out of this small town. You know, yeah. like some people are just bigger than the places that they come from. And it's not necessarily a bad thing because sometimes they stay there and they make that place better. And sometimes they get out and they change the world, you know, yeah. and that's kind of where that song kind of came from. Are you a Casey's Breakfast Pizza fan? I mean, it's interesting. I'm I'm more a fan of Casey's uh, pepperoni. Oh, okay. I mean, we lived. I mean, everywhere in Iowa, there was a Casey's right there, and it was the superior pizza. It's big, town. big controversy in this office. Is well, our boss the pizza settle. reviews? Okay. Yeah. Dave went did a pizza review. He said it wasn't that good, and it was on the well, local news in Iowa. It also depends on the Casey's that you went to. It's you gotta, know? yeah. It's, I mean, yeah. I mean, the the Casey's around the corner from where I used to live. The best. It <laughs> I got to try it. And they were open 24-7, man, so you could roll in yeah. at any time after how many shots and get a whole <laughs> pie, and you'd be like, oh, this my life is made now. Um, Beyond, the first single yeah. from this record. I love the growl before, I think it's the second chorus yeah. in the song. Um, and this one is another one you said was has been in the vault forever. Yeah, man, yeah. This one I, uh, I tried to use in Stone Sour, and they just weren't vibing on it for some reason, man. Um, so I, you know, I kind of stuck it in the pile and, and, and waited a bit, but I knew it wasn't fully formed yet. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So when it came time to do this, I knew I wanted to use it. I sped it up. I stripped it to its sticks, and got basically kind of rewrote. I kept I rewrote the lyrics. Um, I uh, I kept a, a handful of the bits, but I added riffs here and there um and just made it a little more exciting man you know i trimmed the fat basically and uh this one yeah i mean it as soon as we recorded it as soon as people heard it i mean it was like well there's your first single that's the single yeah yeah and the crazy thing is this is how stupid i am i at one point was only going to release beyond as a standalone single and then release cmf2 as its whole thing and not put beyond on it and I had so many people call me an idiot because of that. <laughs> and that to the point where I started kind of, because I always sequence my album before I've even recorded anything, just based off of vibes and whatnot. And as soon as I added it to my sequence and I just went, God, 
it's better. With yeah. Me. And, I, and I just find, I was like, fine, you're right. I'm tired. <laughs> of, I don't even want to talk to you people. You know? I saw you did an interview with uh, Barstool Backstage guys a few weeks ago yeah, in Chicago, dude. and you were talking about how the Beatles, so many of their best songs are just singles. Right. Or you may be like subconsciously doing that thing. Well, it's such a, it's such a cool thing. It's well, it's honestly, it's it's commonplace now. Like yeah, so many true. people release singles these days. It's kind of gone back to that old school way of thinking, which is cool, especially in uh, an era with you know of of streaming and and everybody has their favorite you know kind of DSP and whatnot. And then there are special songs for special DSPs. Um, I just thought it would be a great way to get the song out fast. To get people excited about it. And then when I realized that you could still do that and have it be a part of the album, I was like, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it's you know? two birds, one stone. And and honestly, you're not dividing your powers. You're putting all in one, in one basket and making sure that you're going all in on that one. You know, If you're going to bet big, bet huge. Yeah. And make sure that all of your chips are on the right number. I love that. We Are The Rest, one of my favorites on yeah, this album. Yeah. Just straight up punk, going fast, going crazy. One that is going to sound amazing live, yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's uh, the, I, the funny thing about this song is that I dreamt this song. Oh, and the melody? Then, no, I dreamt the whole thing. I dreamt oh. that we were playing it live. And the audience was singing back at us. The, the lyrics weren't really there yet, yeah. you know? But it was the vibe of it, dude. And I woke up and I recorded the craziest voice memo <laughs> of all time. I still have. Do you, yeah. do you have it? Oh, yeah. Let can me you see play it? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Let me see if I can get it. Um, Is this like a wake up in the middle of the night or the next morning? It was the next morning. And I mean, for real, it was. Where's it at? See if I can find it. Because it's the gang vocals. Are you trying to do gang it vocals was yourself? The gang vocals, like, it was in my head. The whole time. And where's it at? Where's it at? Where's it at? Here it is. Work on this at home. Do 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 I mean you could hear it already. The verses. Uh, guitar stop, drum beat keeps going, bass driving, doing to do vocals. Booze gets a matter with the dumb and to tones of the stand down on bad guys down. Ready down at the town at the town of 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 the That's awesome. It's such a psycho. Like, and my wife's looking at me going, what are you doing? It's but you like, got it in I your head. I dreamt of a song. <laughs> so, yeah. You just know I mean, what it sounds like. Yeah. And I could just hear it. And when I got home, the first thing I did was grab a guitar and I started playing it and working on it. And yeah. then it just became, it became that, man. That's badass. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, and then Midnight. So this one is the first, right. I think, Bowie-inspired song in the album. Kind Are you right about that? Yeah, yeah. This song, I mean, it's definitely got one of those kind of old school like like scary monsters and super creeps kind of vibes to it you yeah know what i mean and it was a song that like i said i wrote and i demoed god way back in 2000 and i and maybe it was because uh for whatever reason i was kind of limited in my musical vision at the time so it didn't have didn't sound like this um but the but the idea was there and Obviously, because I was writing a million other songs at the time, yeah. I just kind of left it by the wayside. But I knew it was one of those tunes that I wanted to kind of come back well, it's to. It's such a different vibe, too. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Especially playing, um, we uh, we kind of ran a Wurlitzer through a distortion pedal. This crazy, like, liquid uh, pedal that, uh, that Tooch had. Um, and I'll kick myself because I can't remember the company, but they were so good. And they sent us a couple of them. We yeah. used them all over the album. And in fact, the thunder that you hear at the beginning of that song is me shaking the pedal. Oh, really? Shaking the pedal. It had this had this natural reverb coil in it, and yet it was running itself through like this weird plasma thing, and it just sounded brilliant. So then we ran the Wurlitzer through it, and it just came up with this crazy like John Carpenter vibe. Yeah. It's and, real spacey, uh, yeah. like slow. So I played that. I was going back and forth between playing that to then playing guitar and stuff. And uh, we tracked it like that. I tracked that with the band in the room together. And it just had this killer vibe to it. And I was like, this is where we go. 
was almost like John Carpenter meets Echo and the Bunny Men. It was yeah. really, really cool. I hear like a little Bring Me the Disco King in there. A little bit, yeah. Just man, a little absolutely. bit of that Bowie. Like I love songs that put you in a very specific mindset. I love, uh, you know, not not that songs need to lead you somewhere, but they, the, you know, a song like this, it, there's a suggestion of the the viewpoint of yeah. the person who's in it, you know, and it's very much a song about me. You know, there have been many nights where, you know, you're kind of struggling with a, with a depressive mindset and you're just like, you know what, I just need to get in my car. I just need to get in my car. I need to put on some music and I need to drive. Yep. And then you just end up circling the city for, you know, 30 to an hour and just kind of trying to get your collective shit together, man. And that's what that song is about. And then the next song, Star Mate, brings you right back to right. that crazy rock vibe. I love yeah. the intro, the off fuck intro. That's cool. Where'd you get that idea? That was fucking real. That really? Was, it was very much real, yeah. Because it was supposed to resolve itself with the next line in the chorus. Yeah. And I was that take. That take, I was so fucking into it. And I was like, and I'm thinking to myself, this is the one. And then I misfretted the E, <laughs> and you can hear me just botch the shit out of it. And I was so angry. And that came from such a fucking honest place. So and then we re recorded it. And I and I, I did the line, oh, I found you, you are mine, right? And then that's when the band comes in. And we tried it. And then as a joke, the band was like, try that 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 fuck up one, that, you know. And they, we flew it in there, and it worked so well. That so I just well, went, yeah. I, just went, I mean, I didn't think it was real. It worked so well. I was oh, like, that's no. a great idea you it's, had. It's very real because you can hear me miss that chord by a fucking <laughs> mile. And it was just, it was so sad to because it's it's such a great song about my wife, you know. Yeah. That I wanted it to kind of have that vibe, but even she was like, oh, yeah, you have to use that. It's fucking amazing, yeah. you know? Um, and then Sorry Me, another Bowie-inspired song here? Kind of. Um, it's actually kind of me-inspired. Uh, people love my acoustic stuff, um, and it's something that I've re- always kind of prided myself on, being able to kind of live in all, like, all of those different worlds. And the acoustic world is definitely something that has been near and dear to my heart I realized I hadn't written anything like that in a long time you know something that was just kind of its own piece that I could just sit down with a guitar and then just play it you know and it was literally the last song that I wrote for the album because I was trying to figure out whether or not it was going to be a guitar song or a piano song and I was really working on a piano and and I was just like man it just doesn't have the isolation that I'm looking for you know, and when I sat down with the guitar and played it, I was like, yeah, there it is, you know, and then, and then we layered it with this really great, uh, capo stuff that we had recorded with, uh, with Tooch and just really killed another, uh, beautiful cello on it. I mean, so it's all very organic and yeah. like nothing is, uh, nothing is, uh, a sample. It's all real shit. You know, yeah, it's great, and that's on the whole album is like that. So, it's uh, it's definitely a very special moment. I mean, talking about living in both worlds, like yeah. you could have the Slipknot world and then the acoustic world. Mm-hmm. I feel like most fans, my speaking for myself right. of yours, have that moment where someone said, "Oh, you ever hear his acoustic stuff?" Right. And you're like, "What? No!" Right. And you put right. it on, you're like, "Oh, it's yeah. way different." The first time someone hears you do the SpongeBob cover. It's a big moment in everyone's yeah. life, you know. Yeah, oh, everyone I know. needs to Trust hear. Trust me, I relive it every <laughs> night now. So, Are you doing it every night? Uh, yeah, because it gets people want to hear it. Yeah. every fucking night. So I've beat people to the punch now, and I just play it. You're like I'm gonna do it. With. Yeah. Like now you can't scream. It's like the dude who screams Skinner at every show. And yeah. He's like fuck you, and you play the we first part of get Freebird. That. Our guitar player has made it a goal to learn the Freebird solo. So now we get it at every show, and Got he has to play it at every hours show. Of it? All it, right, it's, good guess. Good for yeah. you. He's, he's like 75% of the way through it. Uh, all right. But he's, when you make it that far through it, to me, you're 100%. You have to go. You got it. You, you got to finish yeah, it. Yeah, you have to finish it. So, yeah, we get Freebird now all the time. Also, for me, seeing the SpongeBob thing, growing up, Slipknot was a band for me that I loved that I right. wasn't allowed to listen to, which right. I'm sure you've heard a lot. Right. My yeah. brother would burn me CDs of Here's the Rock That You Need to Know, and it was right. just classic rock, classic rock. Right. 
And I remember the third one, he was like, all right, now you're ready for Slipknot. And he made a fake track list where he didn't put any Slipknot songs on it. So my mom didn't know we were listening. Interesting. So That's yeah, some sneaky shit, right? That there. was that like was a that. big covert mission for us. Uh, and then great. like, if the Walkman that's was great. too loud, my mom would be like, "What is that?" Yeah. Be like, not Slipknot. It's <laughs> Twisted Sister. Going I swear. On, yeah. Uh, yeah. We're not gonna take rock. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Punchline. Honestly, one of my favorite songs in the whole album. That's I think this one. is just such a kick-ass rock song. Thanks, man. Thank you. That's one of those songs. It's it's one of those songs where. It really kind of just started with me just riffing in my in my uh, jam room, which is kind of like my, my my man cave. That's where I set up. It's where I get away from the kids and everything, the dogs and everything. And I go in there and I just kind of work on music. And I just kind of came up with I came up with the chorus first, and then I I came back to the uh, uh, the the verse riff basically. And it was just something that just sounded fucking cool as shit, you know. So literally, the lyrics came last. Like I, I wrote the music top to bottom first, and then wrote the lyrics to it. Um, especially the end, where I was like, I, I just wanted yeah. the end to explode. Um, so trying to find that that balance, and trying to find a topic that could transition from one the, from that first bit to that last kind of crazy Metallica bit. Yeah. You know? um, it was it was challenging. Then I realized it was like well, it's it's it has to have like almost like a cynical, kind of satirical vibe. You know, yeah. it's like where, you know, just when you think you've got life figured out, it throws all this crazy shit at you, and you realize that everything's a lesson. And if you don't listen to those lessons, you're going to repeat yourself. When it comes to mistakes, when it comes to relationships, when it comes to the people that you allow in your life. Um, and that's kind of where that song is. It's, it's just about knowing your boundaries, knowing that, you know, there are going to be people who challenge your trust and challenge your heart in life. And if you don't recognize the warning signs, you may or may not end up hurting yourself for no fucking reason, man. Yeah. And I saw you say it's kind of like the flip side of Sorry Me. Yeah. Like yeah. lyrically, it, because you just have to kind of get the you have to get the earth under your feet before you can walk anywhere. Yeah, you know, and sorry me is kind of that floating in the ocean vibe, where I've always described it as you know underwater looking up and the only thing you can see is the moon through the surface. You know, punchline is kind of breaking the surface and and trying to swim for shore, um, but you don't really know how far it is but you know you're heading in the right direction yeah um someday i'll change your mind pretty uplifting like yeah. builds you know to a very anthemic end there and i i loved your quote on this one you unleashed your inner kings of leon here damn right i yeah. love that yeah kings of leon you too um to me you know i, I joshua tree is one of my favorite albums i love that fucking album and the songwriting is so incredible and Kings of Leon, I mean, fucking Sex is on Fire is so good yeah. that, um, you know, I, it, it's just one of those, It's it was one of those things where I was writing a song for my wife, and, and this song's about her, and it's 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 actually a line, the, the title is a line from a conversation that we were having early on in our relationship, um, where she was basically just telling me, it's just like, how do I believe anything that you fucking say? And I was like, well, I get that. Someday I'm going to change your mind about that, you know? And that was something that we held on to, and we would always kind of point to that as the the starting point. You yeah. Know? And uh, so I wrote this song, and I embarrassed the shit out of her by having our friends help me sing it for her for her birthday, <laughs> um, which I have video of. Yeah. Um, and it was kind of I was still kind of putting the song together right so it wasn't like fully finished yet but it was cool to kind of see her just sitting there just like you know. <laughs> I mean it's like getting happy birthday sung to you exactly. is always the worst right. yeah. yeah yeah you're just waiting for somebody with a cake with sparklers in it to come out of the back and yeah go, here you go you get 20 percent <laughs> off your meatloaf you know? yeah it's like so um but it's true, man. You know, my wife is the the most, you know, besides my children, obviously, my, the, the, the most important person in my life to me. And she is a person who inspires me to be better. And if you're not with somebody who inspires you to be better, then you're just spinning your wheels. 
Agreed. That's awesome. I just got the wrap, so I think you got to get out of here. Okay. Yeah. Um, you want to speed through the last, the, the, last fi- couple? the final two. All okay. I want is hate. Little satirical. Okay. Beatles rip there. Right. Yes. And as I I know I'm stepping into the fire with this because <laughs> I'm just as big a Beatles yeah. fan. Love the Beatles. No, I know. Yeah. Love the Beatles. <laughs> All you need is love is one of the worst pieces of shit. Ever Do you written. think the worst Beatles song? I 100 percent think. think and I'm worse than "Run for Your Life." Worse than "Run for Your Life." <laughs> worse than "Rocky Raccoon." Worse than all of Revolution that weird Nine. 50, oh fuck yeah! Because I, I can listen to those. Yeah. I dude, when all you need is love comes on, I can't shut the fucking thing off <laughs> fast enough. I can't skip it fast enough. It's just so fucking sappy and hippie and it's hippie and i get why they wrote it yeah i get why they wrote it so that you'll get why i wrote that you yeah know what i mean no and, and i love it i think it's great it's, yeah and it's a great the ending counterpoint it's perfect and then the final one dead flies Dead flies man is probably one of the best songs i've ever written it, it's one of the songs that i wrote with tooch um star mate he wrote the music for it and i wrote the lyrics and then dead flies is actually two songs that we had each and then we just put those songs together yeah and it became this fucking magnum opus oh shit I'm, I'm <laughs> it became this incredible fucking i don't want to say odyssey because that's very fucking pretentious <laughs> it's but real it was, good though it yeah. was massive dude it's it's a really special song and it's a spe- it's it's essentially about leaving those toxic people behind um to their own devices to their own self-sabotage knowing that if they stay on that same fucking track, the only thing left around them will be dead flies because they will be all, all alone in life. And it's just a great way to end the album. I was going to say hell of a song to yeah, end the album. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah. It's awesome. Check it out now. It's out now. CMF2. Corey Taylor, thank you for coming in. All good, man. Appreciate it.